Uh, they would assume if you're a household of five and you visited that household, then you've got five months. Oh, yeah. right? Um, but do you think that conversation is changing uh, within families? No, absolutely not. I, I think we definitely, you know, there has been a shift, there has been a change because I see a lot of my friends who typically are one party, but because they did their own research, because they have their their own personal values and beliefs, they're going to candidates on the opposite end of the aisle because they find that they're candidates that have the same values, that they align there. So it's really interesting to see, honestly, and it really does show the intergenerational and how politics kind of plays into that. Right. Did anyone else have anything to add about um, getting the youth, younger adult vote out? Mm. I think uh, I think there's a, a lot of younger uh, young adults like even myself before I've only recently started tuning in obvious honestly is just it's just that ugliness and just that division uh, you know just you know bear it get through it uh, learn learn about the issues learn about the candidates because they write the laws that dictate our lives <laughs> so it's you know more important than presidential elections are arguably uh, this is local politicians the local government sphere is what is in control of our our local uh, our, our, our island environment uh, both literal and figurative with uh, with uh, our, the way our businesses are run and the way we live our lives um, all, all, my, all kinds of matters yeah just get involved as much as it as, as much as it sucks <laughs> get involved <laughs> yeah um, I think for me you know this is only going to be my third election that I vote in right so as a young person and as a young professional, we kind of tend to kind of second guess ourselves. And so we kind of are a little bit scared to go into the polls because we're not, yeah, because like we're not familiar with the process, you know. I will have to commend the Guam Election Commission. They try to do their best in making it as accessible as possible, but it's really up to the candidates. It's up to the candidates to inspire the voters, inspire the young people to get out, to have, to put a vote and a trust in them so that way to produce legislation that, you know, aligns their values and beliefs, you know. Tropics is your weekly roundup of the hottest properties on Guam. Every Thursday, get a virtual walkthrough of homes, apartments, townhomes, and land available for lease, rent, or sale with a breakdown of the most important info, including costs, features, and of course, location details. Watch it on KO News Hotspot at 11 a.m. on streaming and TV8 or catch the Encore at 5 p.m. on TV11. You can also check out each installment on Instagram too. Properties in the Tropics is presented by Remax Diamond Realty. No waiting in line to see your doctor or to pick up your medication. From tips to living a healthier lifestyle, nutrition and fitness, to the latest wellness trends, stay healthy by checking in for your weekly dose of health news on Health Check every Tuesday on KUAM News Extra. Health Check is presented by Island Cancer Center. All right, everybody, we're back, but uh, we don't have any new numbers, but we do have the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Josh Norrie, is standing by with uh, Hannah DeMonzo over at uh, uh, Lou and Josh headquarters. Hannah and Daniel. <laughs> Nestor, it's after 3.30 a.m., but as you can see behind me, the audience is not tired. They're still going strong, showing their support for this gubernatorial team. So, Lieutenant Governor, how are you feeling? The numbers are kind of showing they're favorable. Yeah, no, we're very, uh, very happy with the numbers. Uh, and uh, going throughout the island and uh, taking a look at our camp, I have to say that um, this is a direct result of the hard work that our leaders and our supporters and our volunteers have been doing over the last few months. Uh, it is our uh, campaign, not just me and Lou, it's our campaign. Uh, and we're in this to win for the people of Guam and improve the quality of their lives. And I asked this earlier to the governor, but I know the numbers are very favorable, but if for some reason you guys should not advance on to the general election, do you believe the island's people are still in good hands? Well, you know what, um, you know, we, people that are running for office, <laughs> um, they have a love for the island, for sure. You know, and we always hope that whoever wins 
is going to do the best job possible. But I'm very confident that out of the three teams that are running, we are the ones that can move the island forward for sure. LT, and you guys are leading 3,650, but of course that is just only the third round of the ballots. There's still a fair amount to be counted. So are you guys going to remain cautiously optimistic? Yeah, of course, you always have to be cautiously optimistic. You have to wait until all the votes come in. But, you know, quite frankly, we have managed to build a pretty good lead. Uh, and I think that we're showing that this trend is going to continue. Uh, I expect the uh, trend to expand uh, when the South comes in. Of course, you know, the South is my adopted home now. I'm from Talafofo. Those are my people back there. Uh, and of course, uh, the governor and I, are our hometown, uh, also Sinahanya, they haven't come in. So I really do think that the rest of the villages are going to deliver the same kind of margin uh, and it's going to grow. All right, LT, anything more you would like to add before we, we, we close off? I just want to thank the people of Guam for coming out and encourage everybody uh, to come out and vote. Uh, the election is going to be in, few month, in a few months in November. We have an opportunity to uh, not only move our island for four more years, but elect some great public servants in the Guam legislature that are going to help us. And I'm really excited about all the candidates that are coming out, and I'm really confident that we're going to work very hard not only to deliver an expanded Democratic majority, but also we're going to elect a female to the U.S. House of Representatives. All right, everybody. Lieutenant Governor Joshua Tenorio. She's, she's Anna Devonzo. Of course, LT's just wrapped up. And now I'm Daniel Perez. Back to you in the studio, Nestor. All right, thanks, uh, Daniel and Hannah and Lieutenant Governor. Uh, appreciate your time there. Okay, uh, if we gonna, we want to run down some of the numbers uh, from uh, Jason. Join me over here. Uh, okay, here's the latest. Here's the latest. Uh, we've only had three batches: 24 of 67 precincts, uh, 7,285 votes cast, uh, 6,107 of those ballots are Democrat. 1,006 so Republican, uh, crossover 164. Uh, as of 3.36 a.m., 12.53% of the vote is out. Well, speak of your coworker and he shall appear. That's the rule here <laughs> on KUM. And uh, speaking of appear, a lot of voters have appeared in the uh, voting precinct today to cast their votes for Talina Nelson on the left and Dr. Judy Wanpat on the right. It is the former Speaker of the Legislature, of course, Dr. Judy Wanpat, uh, Talina Nelson, of course, uh, Vice Speaker, uh, but it is Dr. Judy Wanpat having a comfortable 500 vote lead. But remember, um, as we get, hopefully not too much later, but uh, but as some of the larger villages come in, uh, again, your Santa Rita's, your Dedidos, your Jigos, your um, Jotnias, that could very easily change. 500 is... Um, is a somewhat comfortable margin, but that could very easily flip. So it is uh, Dr. Juan Pat enjoying a slight lead right now. Of course, this is Jim Moylan. He is the sole Republican running for congressional Democrat or congressional uh, delegate, I should say. He will advance. Uh, he's got 832 votes of his own right now. The gubernatorial race, of course, you just heard from our lieutenant governor, and it is he and his running mate, Luli Angura, of course. Uh, Governor Leon Guerrero, a long time, um, she has been a member of the legislature on many occasions. She also, uh, her family owns the Bank of Guam, so she has worked as the CEO of that organization. She is a uh, financial expert, a business person, of course, a registered nurse as well. Uh, they have a strong, and you know, talking about comfortable leads, that is a very, very strong lead over Congressman Michael Sinichols, who used to work at the Bank of Guam, of course, himself. Uh, some of our analysts have been um, noting that Congressman Sinichols' background is in finance, and he has worked in that. And then Sabrina salas uh for 25 years, worked here at KUM as a broadcast journalist. The Republican gubernatorial team that will advance uh, features a former Chief Executive of the Government of Guam, that would be Felix Camacho on the right, and um, businessman, policyman, uh, many, many hats has Tony Adam worn in for our community in both the private and public sectors over the years. They have 941 votes. Uh, you're seeing there a live shot of Election Central right now, as Nick was saying. So, uh, the tempo maybe has slowed down a little bit, but then again, you know, it, all it takes is a couple 
big villages to come in and you're going to see activity pick up real real quick i can take over here from here <laughs> jason all right so senatorial side the democrats uh, speaker therese terlahi on and on top with 4406 votes uh, our former colleague here at koam daryl chris malafunction barnett 3,967. Joe S. and Augustine, 3,616. He's got to get back to work because they got to pass a budget by Wednesday. <laughs> Amanda Shelton, 3,445. Tina Rose Munya Barnes, 3148. Roy Kanata, a newcomer, 2,673. Incumbent Senator Sabina Perez, 2,583. Another newcomer, Will Parkinson, whose dad was a senator yep. uh, back in the day, 2,556. Uh, Sarah Thomas Nedida, former Democratic Party chairperson, 2,526. And rounding out the top 10 is former Senator Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano with 2,390. Former Police Chief Fred Bordaglio, 2,349. Dwayne Sinicholas, uh, 2,304. Jose Pito Trelawney, another incumbent, 2,248. Jonathan Savaris, the uh, son of uh, Dededo Mayor uh, Melissa Savaris, 2,189. And rounding out the top 15, Angela Santos, 2002. Jason? All right. All right, let's go to the Republicans now as it is Frank Bloss Jr. and Chris Duenas both in the lead right now. Both have Before exactly 767 votes, so there is a tie for the number one spot. Number three goes to Jesse Lujan, who looks to return to a seat that he held for quite some time in the legislature as a member of the GOP. He has followed four through eight with incumbent Joanne Brown. Uh, hopefully returning to her seat is Mana Silva Tyron. Tom Fisher, the first-time candidate, long-time lawyer. He is at number six with 662 votes. Teletidigui is in number seven. Of course, she a, a incumbent. And Michelle Hope Titano, of course, a long-time member, Nestor of the Guam Parole Board. Michelle is at number eight. Vince Borja is in his second senatorial uh, campaign. He has 573 votes, which has earned him the number nine ranking. David Chrysostomo, first-time candidate, 542 votes. Does David have? He is at number 10. And then Dr. Sam Mabini Young. She has previously been a senator. Uh, she has authored many pieces of uh, legislation, very, very progressive ones. I might add, she is at number 11. Sandra Regis Seau, she has been involved with education and with um, many forms of business. She worked in the state, she worked in Alaska, she worked in Tennessee, all over the South. She is at number 12. Ken Leon Guerrero is at number 13. Bistra Mindiola is number 14. Bistra, of course, a first time candidate herself. Ian Catling is also a first time candidate. He is at number 15. And then Harvey. Egna, the former banker, recently retired. He is at number 16 with 306 votes to round out your Republican senatorial candidates. All right, Jason, 342 in the morning. Uh, but we have uh, Nick Delgado standing by at Election Central with the latest. Here he Nick, is. Nick, <laughs> tell, us, tell us what's happening. Yes, thanks. 30 precincts counted. It has been an hour wait now since the second batch, or the third batch rather, has come in. This batch now uh, shows Governor Lou Leon Guerrero, Lieutenant Governor Josh Norio at 4,827 votes or 60 percent, and St. Nicholas of Metzanani at 3,203 votes uh, or 39 uh, percent. So again, Leon Guerrero, 408 4,827 or 60%. St. Nicholas and Metzanani, 3,203 votes or 39%. That is the Democratic ticket right there. Um, we received 30 of 67 precincts. That's a total of 9,730 votes cast so far. Uh, not much change when it comes to looking at the Democratic side for the legislative race, but we're going to give you the numbers updated right now. Therese Terlahi, 5,812. Daryl Chris Barnett, 5,275. Joe St. Augustine, 4,908. Amanda Shelton, 4,632. Tina Munia Barnes, 4,240. Roy Kanata, 3,655. Sabina Perez, 3,557. William Parkinson, 3,532. Sarah Nedadog, 3,370. Kelly Marsh Titano, 3,290. Fred Verdalio, 3,225. Jonathan Savarez, 3,074. Dwayne St. Nicholas, 3,061. Jose Terlahi, 3,006. Angela Santos, 
2,713. Roy Gamboa, 2,361. Alex Duenas, 2,348. John Aninich, 2,096. David Duenas is at 2,087. Frank Menno, 1,915. And Armando Dominguez, 1,521. Uh, moving over to the uh, non-voting delegate race, we have Judy Wanpat at 4,020 votes, or 54% of the votes, and Talina Nelson, 3,308 votes, or 44% of the votes. Again, Wanpat, 4,020, or 54%, and Talina Nelson, 3,308, or 44%. Um, James Moylan, his votes now up, inched up to 1,061 total votes. Um, for the Republican governor and lieutenant governor candidates, Camacho Adit, they received 1,213 votes under the Republican legislative ticket. Frank Bloss Jr. leading and switching up above uh, Chris Duenas. This batch, for the fourth batch, 964 votes for Frank Bloss Jr., uh, 962 votes for Chris Duenas, 872 votes for Jesse Lujan, 854 votes for Joanne Brown, 847 for Tom Fisher, 839 for Mana Silva Tyron, 796 for Tello Tidegui, 789 for Michelle Titano, 732 for Vince Borja, 698 for Sam Abini Young, 693 for Joaquin Leon Guerrero, 688 David Crisostomo, 677 Sandra Sow, 650 for Bistro Mendiola, 489 for Ian Catling, and 398 for Harvey Egna. The Attorney General's race showing Doug Moylan at 4,752 votes or 50 percent, leaving Camacho 4,571 votes. 4,571 votes for Levin Camacho at 48%. So again, Moylan, 4,752 or 50%, and uh, Camacho, 4,571 or 48%. Again, this is 30 of the 67 precincts, so nearly half of what we've been waiting for here. And it looks like election co uh, the commissioners have been bringing the results to us every hour uh, at the bottom of each hour since we've been receiving them. The fourth batch now heading uh, into several hours of just covering this. We uh, have a total of 9,730 total ballot casts with the numbers, the Democrat numbers, those that voted for Democrats, 8,185 of them. Republicans that voted, 1,295. Again, this is just of the 30 precincts that have been counted so far. Spoiled ballots and crossovers, 242 uh, counted so far. For a total vo voter turnout of 16.73%, uh, again, this is just 30 of the 67 precincts counted. But again, the race that everyone's watching here tonight, the Angarel Tenorio, currently at 4,827 votes, 60% over Sir Nicholas Matanani, 3,203 votes, or 39%. I want to take you real quick to a look at where we are in terms of the ballot boxes that have been counted so far. The, the stack here behind me continues to grow. Uh, we have the precincts uh, in for Hagatnya, Asamayina, Pidi, uh, Hagat, Malesu, Inalahan, Ordot Chalampago, Aganya Heights, Barragata, Manilao, uh, most of Dededo, and nearly all of Jigo. So the two highest uh, uh, amount of registered voters, villages up north that we were bringing you coverage today earlier or yesterday now, uh, most of those ballots have been counted. And again, the results that we were seeing in this fourth batch uh, for Leon Guerrero Tenorio, 4,827 or 60 percent and Sir Nicholas uh, Matsunani, 3,203 or 39%. Uh, I just want to continue to give you a look here behind me uh, at those stacks of boxes. This is the precincts over here. This is the ballot boxes uh, from each precinct to the left being stacked uh, along the benches here. That is the boxes that have been counted. 
that those are the boxes that uh, that have already been run through the machine, have already been uh, checked off and signed off by commissioners, um, and then they're going to continue to do to do this until all of the boxes uh, continue to come in. But again, the fourth batch coming in just at 3:31 this morning uh, with those results uh, from from each of the parties, each of the candidates. And I want to bring in now again the senior advisor for the Camacho Attic campaign, uh, Sean Gumatauto, to speak with us a little bit more on his take of the, res the results. Half a day, Sean. Hey, uh, good morning there. Uh, and and uh, as we're seeing it, it's uh, nearly halfway. So I think for all of us, we're uh, just kind of anticipating the next, that next batch, I think, for uh, that will probably set the tone for the balance of the uh, the morning, more than, more than likely. Right. The camp of the party and the, the Tumuting headquarters already wrapping up a couple right. hours back. Uh, what was what was that decision that made them say, all right, let's close up and wait for the numbers? I think for, for, for the most part, because obviously we're not the ones with the primary, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of what, as the, the uh, results were kind of delayed, it just made some sense just to go ahead and uh, kind of get everybody home. But we've been keeping... Uh, Keeping everyone abreast, so it's uh, it's a matter of just uh, getting to. I think it's the next uh, results that'll pretty much, uh, at least for our evening, will definitely uh, make it a little bit better, or at least this morning for yeah. sure. As we saw here, we were watching the live stream on KUAM. Our teams did speak with the candidates, with yes. with Governor uh, Felix Camacho and Senator Tony Adet. Uh, any any updates from them and hearing them in the last couple of hours? Well, I, I think what, what we're all watching is obviously what's happening on the other side. But importantly, I think is the we haven't seen results from the governor's home village of Tumani. We have not seen some of the, uh, I think right now, m a lot of Dededo is in, Jigo's, uh, where, it, you know, it's, uh, what, I think three of the nine or four of the nine precincts are there. So we're still waiting for some of the other villages to report. So mm -hmm. I think that's critical for all of us is to, to kind of wait and see how that goes, especially Tumani, uh, where, where Governor uh, Camacho uh, resides. Yeah, you're right, Tumani. None of those have, that I've been noting here when we're seeing these uh, boxes being uh, stacked over here have been actually counted and run, run through the machines. Uh, could that change the, the numbers that we're seeing so far, though, drastically? I, I think for, for Governor Camacho's numbers, it will definitely change yeah. uh, that. Um, I mean, obviously, there was a lot of time put in, um, you know, with the help of the, the mayor of Timoning uh, and, and the entire campaign. But also, I think we haven't seen, you know, Jonya, we haven't seen... Uh, Talfofo, we hadn't seen Sena, mm -hmm. uh so we're but we're all very curious on how that all how all those would play out, um, not just on Governor Camacho's side, but for the uh, other other uh, other side of the ballot for the most part. Yeah, and uh, I just want to get your take now, looking at how the numbers were going for the race that everyone was watching here for the primary between the Angarero and, and St. Nicholas. The sure. number is now 4,827 for the Angarero Sonorio, 3,203 for St. Nicholas Mazzanotti. Uh, they're, they're kind of been inching between 60 and the 30 percentage uh, back and forth there. Well, what's your take? I, I think f when we look at it historically, when we were looking at her, her last primary, it's pretty close to what she had performed in the last primary. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the incumbency for a bit and the amount of effort and the amount of time put in is that number uh, seems a bit low. Um, and for us, it'll be about, uh, again, in just a couple of hours to start preparing for a general election uh, with that, uh, with that, uh, I guess, fact in front of us. Yeah, does that change kind of the direction and the tactic that the campaign has moving forward, seeing these? I think we've been uh, all night thinking about what will be the next step, and I think we're very excited to get right into the general election cycle. I mean, based on this, I think we're, yeah, we're absolutely uh, fired up to get, uh, get, uh, you know, get this uh, general election cycle going. Yeah, we'll see what the numbers continue to look like throughout the night. Thank you, Sean Gubatato, uh with the Camacho Ada campaign, of course, speaking with us and giving his take on the numbers we've received so far. But again... Fourth batch coming in just uh, around 3.30 this morning. The Angarero Sonorio, 4,827 votes or 60%. And St. Nicholas Metzanani at 3,203 votes of 39%. And this, again, is only 30 of the 67 precincts that we received so far. So keep it here, and we'll bring you the numbers as we continue to get them. We'll send it back to the studio for now. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks. 
Nick, um, so um, as you said, 60-40 uh, right now, uh, Lou and Josh over Mike and Bree. Um, 30 out of 67 precincts uh, reporting, 4,827 4, votes to 3,203. Um, it's about 4 o'clock in the morning, Ron. Um, is it too soon to call this? Is that, is that a big enough sample size to, uh, to declare a winner? I think it's going to take a little bit more, but not much. And you know what? If uh, our audience right now, they're the people who really love politics. <laughs> so this is a labor of love. Or they're just Nestor. waking up. <laughs> now, it could be. It could be they're waking up, too. But certainly this is a labor of love. And I, I think that we uh, uh, there. I think that the, the count is going to really it's going to have a cascade. It's going to happen really quickly in the next uh, I believe within the next hour. I think it's going to be over. So we, we hope so, certainly. Okay, which uh, ra races should we continue to look at? Is is the like congressional uh, race pretty much decided with uh, uh, Judy Wanpat over Talita Nelson? You think that's going to hold? Right now we've got um, 3,308 uh, for Talina and 4,020 for uh, Speaker Wanpat. Right, so it's about 700. But then again, we got to watch. This is a very uneven race, and and. There are pockets, and I noticed this when I did my own exit poll, because I do the sites also to get a feel of, of what the numbers look like. And the place I was in had a real Tolina pocket. And so as these pockets kind of play out, we may see uh, these numbers get closer and closer. I'm not sure if it'll be enough to tip the scale, but we never, never know at this point for that particular race for Congress. Uh, for, I think for the governor's race, I think, it, as I said earlier with Jason, it's a defensive race. I think it's going to continue, and, and the numbers are pretty set. Uh, interestingly enough, on the legislative side, uh, the first 10, I know it was mentioned earlier by now, the first 10 on each side should be pretty well established, and most of the shuffling will happen in those lower tiers. And so if somebody's in the first 10, either in the Republican or Democrat side, they're pretty safe uh, for sure, and then, then the others kind of juggle around. But, uh, you know, I, and I've said this before also, and I'll just say it again, it takes a lot of heart and it takes a lot of determination to run for these offices, and my hat's off to these, these folks who do it. And, and, and it's, it's, it's always neat to watch people run, run for office, and we've seen some innovations in this election campaign so far. I hope we'll continue to see that. Yeah. So let me just run through the numbers real quick. Uh, the senatorial uh, on the Democrat side, uh, Speaker Therese Terlai continues in the top spot, 5,812. Uh, Chris Barnett, 5,275. Um, Joe St. Augustine, 4,908. Amanda Sheldon, 4,632. Tina Barnes, 4,240. Roy Kanata, number six, 3,655. Okay, now I can see it better. <laughs> Sabina Perez, 3,557. I was squinting there, yes, okay. Will Parkinson, 3,532. Uh, Sarah Thomas Nettedog, 3,570. And um, in former Senator uh, Dr. Kelly Marsh, tied to know 3,290. That's the top 10. Um, so um, as you were saying, I think that the, the top 10 are pretty safe at this point. But going forward into the, uh, the general election, because, of course, they're going to be going up against the Democrats. So... Um, that's still, you're, you're in the top 10, but you're going up against um, the Republicans, rather. So um, that's not, still not going to guarantee you, you still got work to do, yeah? Always work to do. And you know, it's interesting, uh, we've talked about it before, when there's a, a, a Democrat governor, the legislature will eventually turn Republican. And I'm not sure if it'll happen in this election or the next election. And that's according to what we call critical election theory from uh, a theorist called V.O. Key. And so he came up with these uh, majorities within the legislatures or, or, or within election cycles and how it relates to the executive. And so we'll see. We'll see where this goes. But I think that uh, it's always fun to watch uh, how people play out. And I'll tell you, you want to talk about a beauty contest? Put yourself in for political office and find out what people really think of you. Everybody has a voodoo doll out for somebody in this town. And so that's the chance, I'll tell you. If you can put it back to the attorney general, that's right. an interesting race too. That's uh, probably the closest uh, of the one uh, t of the ones tonight. And even though they're not uh, running head to head, they will face off in the uh, general election. What do you make of that, Ron? Uh, four thousand five hundred seventy-one to four thousand seven hundred. Leave him pulling ahead now. That's a uh, well. Oh, leave him. No. Well, no, he's, he's still behind. He's still behind. Four five still seven one. Oh, the, oh, okay. You yeah. Add, you, oh, you, you, carry, oh, you carry the one. Oh. Yeah. Four, seven, Hundred eighty votes. Four seven. But you know that's well within the margin sure. of error. So it's essentially this is a tie, right? Um, what do you make of that race? 
Well, I don't know if it's a tie because Levin's the incumbent. He's the sitting incumbent. And usually sitting incumbents should have some, some advantage. And so that's a very competitive race. It's certainly one that, that they're both working on, on very hard. But also, uh, if you, and here's the thing nobody's ever talked about. Have we ever had a two-term attorney general? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no. no, we have not. No, yeah. it's yeah. a tough job. Yeah. And again, Doug, Doug Moylan became the island's first elected AG right. in 2002. Two. 2002. Was it, two, in, was it that he, far back? He came in with Camacho, right? When Camacho mm -hmm. became governor. And he established, and he doesn't get a lot of credit for this, but, and I want to say something good about both of them, but I say this, but Doug Moylan established a lot of the, the structures of the Attorney General's office because he made that office independent, and he mm -hmm. helped to structure it and, and, and create the, the systems within the AG's office, and then later AG's inherited, and they continued. And certainly, uh, AG... Uh, <clears throat> Levin, Levin Camacho has also continued a lot of those things and, and he's also in his own way has his own style of being an AG and mm -hmm. I, I think that it's an interesting contrast. These two candidates are very different and so for the general election we're gonna you know we're gonna see I think a lot more interplay between them. And this, re this closeness uh, uh, in the race will continue into the general I, I imagine. Right I mean it, 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 that's a tough job. It's you know being the attorney general is one of the five toughest jobs on Guam, yeah. uh, and it's a tough job. It's not an easy job. You can never make everybody happy, uh, especially when you have to prosecute people's relatives and their relatives get all mad at you and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it's it's a tough job, yeah. especially on an island. Okay. And do you think, um, given Ag Camacho's experience now and you know given the fact that he that he has you know served for a term does his does his, that experience combined with his relative youth compared to you know compared to Doug who is considerably older I don't I don't want to sound like I'm taking a swipe at anybody here but just because somebody has experience doesn't mean it's good experience and you mm -hmm. can say that about anybody right in, in running for the AGs you can judge whether you view their experiences as good or bad you can say that about broadcasters I'm the baby over here. <laughs> I'm still learning and and college professors right yeah. just because you're I, could, you're I couldn't right. I couldn't even add yeah. the four yeah. four thousand seven hundred fifty one yeah. and four thousand well, late it's late <laughs> yeah and, and, and there's a reason for it. and I've drank a lot of coffee that's another thing so you know <laughs> I and you guys don't think I have it's okay but, all right yeah. well, what, do you, what do you guys want to do back there waiting for instructions oh yeah we're gonna go for a break okay we're gonna take a break and uh, we will continue this uh, past four o'clock 402 in the morning Hang but uh, we will be back tonight's election coverage is brought to you in partnership with hanum purified drinking water pepsi and cs coffee shop Off the guys, Decision 22 continues here, a uh, collaboration between One Micronesia and Pacific Matters, talking to young voters about issues and this upcoming election. Right, so we've neared the end of our conversation, believe it or not, and uh, I just wanted to ask both of you uh, what your advice to others trying to decide who to vote for, and maybe not necessarily who to vote for, but even like we spoke in the last segment, to vote in the first place. Uh, either of you want to pick us up here? Yeah, my advice is don't just listen to what the candidates and the incumbents say on their own social medias. Listen to what the news articles have been currently and in the past, see what their record is like, and it's all out there. It's all online. You can see all of that. So don't just listen to you know, a, a candidate's own social media. Listen to what um, your, your friends and family, um, people you agree with, people you don't agree with, listen, just try to get all of that feedback. Because a, a lot of the research is hard to do. Like myself, I have not, I have not researched every single candidate. I'm going to talk to a bunch of uh, friends and colleagues I respect and trust to just kind of see where they're at and see who they like, who they don't like, and why. And that will be a big part of forming my decisions is like who are the people that I trust who do do their research, who are they invested in, and uh, who do they believe are, is invested back in Guam. And that'll be a 
mostly how I decide all <laughs> who I vote for. And yeah, but most importantly, do shop around for answers. Don't just listen to one particular candidate's uh, social media feed because it's going to be the, that's obviously the most biased way you can go. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so for me, for the young people, I just want to say that, you know, your vote is your voice. And as cliche as it sounds, it is more important now more than ever to go out to the polls and cast your vote because you may think that, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to I'm going to just deal with whoever's in, in place. But that's not it. Because like you said earlier, um, the the public servants that we elect, they're going to be they're going to be influ influencing the legislation and the policy and just our community for the next four or two years. And so we want to ensure that as a young person, if you want these topics that you're passionate about to be heard and to be addressed, you need to go out and look for these candidates. And like you said earlier, you know, don't, you know, shop around, do your research. Now more than ever, we actually have to not look at just the social media page. We need to meet them in public. You know, they're, they're public people, you know, we see their billboards everywhere. So, you know, if you see them at like Kmart, say, yeah, oh hi, you know, we have a few minutes and for, you know, for, for the most part, they're really like happy to talk to you about these issues, so. And I figured we'd close with talking about um, why you both uh, personally care about uh, the issues at hand, um, and hopefully sharing why you care more, and you know, invite others to care too about about something um, that might get them to vote. So Stephanie, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, why why is the time now? Why is it more important than ever? Just like you said. Yeah. So it's as a young person, we're going to be going to our, our own chosen career fields and we want to ensure that the candidates that we put in place are going to help not only the career field grow, but help you grow as a person too. I mean, there are a lot of programs that help our community kind of make ends meet throughout the pandemic. And so it's really important that we, you know, say what's in, what we think our community needs to better ourselves and then just kind of go from there. Anything fair and closing words from you about why people should care about issues? So, because it's our island and it's our lives, so it's like, you know, there's politicians, our elected leaders, they, they write the laws and enforce the laws that uh, we, we function in as a society and as individuals. And um, it's, it's easy to complain. It's so easy to complain. I have so many complaints myself, but it doesn't, complaining doesn't really do anything. You have to participate in the process. You have to vote if you want to uh, have any chance of fixing whatever your complaints are about. And you just got to participate in the process. All right, there you heard it. Uh, we want to thank Coffee Slam uh, so much uh, for hosting this conversation. Uh, thank you to Farron and Stephanie for your time. And, uh, you heard it from them. Go out and vote. Uh, it's been uh, Vic and Tomas with One Micronesia and Pacific Matters. This is Decision 2022. See you next time. the 2022 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Culture Club. Hafa day Guam, I'm Jason Salas. This is a special edition of Canvassing with KUM where we talk to members of our community about their concerns as they head to the poll, what they want to see from their elected leaders, and just basically their thoughts on the state of the island. And you know, I have the great pleasure of hosting a real estate segment called House to Home each and every Tuesday. And over the seven years that I've done this uh, segment, I've come to know actually two wonderful local women, two realtors who have taught me a lot about that industry. Of course, Gina Campos and Liz Duenas. And during that time, we've had many, many conversations and we've shared you know, many opinions and, and they have certainly, um, a lot of which, we haven't always expressed on the show because it just didn't fit the context of the show, but seeing how it is an election and seeing how they are not only professional realtors, but uh, leaders in their industry. They're also mothers and grandmothers and they're, they're just Guamanians and they have certain expectations and deservedly so from their elected leaders. So joining me now on the KUM couch for this very special episode are 
Gina and Liz. Half a day, ladies. Half a day, Liz. I want to say, this is the first time we've actually shared this studio space in, in three years. So it's, yep. It's, yep. It's so very good to see you guys. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Yep. And today it's nice to be actually to be here at KUM. I know, I was just about habitually just to ask you, uh, Gina, your, your mic's muted, but no, you're, you're here right now. <laughs> I'm here. We're, you we're can't mute me now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and, and hopefully we, we won't need to because that's, you know, I wanted to have the two of you here because, um, you know, obviously the economy is very, very important to you. Uh, family values are important to you. The, the direction our island may or may not be headed is important to you. So Gina, yeah. let's start with you. Um, seeing how this is election day right now, um, what components of not only who is running, but the platforms on which they stand, you know, like really stick out to you? Um, in terms of platform, you know, I, I see there's a few candidates that I've been watching their interviews. You know, I, I want to thank KUM because that's where I've been going for to be able to look at the interviews and to see what these candidates are, are all about. You don't get you don't get enough from that. Right. Mm -hmm. But in terms of platform, the, the thing that the thing that concerns me, and I use that word concern, is when the, senator, the potential senators are saying that what they're looking for or what their goal is going to be is to, pre uh, to preserve our environment. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to ha you know, preserve the environment. Like, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm about picking up the trash, making sure that things are done in a proper way so that we do preserve the environment, protecting the aquifer. I'm all for that. But what I'm looking for in a candidate is the person that remembers that the, envi the preservation of the environment is for the people. And sometimes I believe we forget that and that concerns me when someone puts the environment ahead of private property rights. And so I'm going to be really looking for the senators that have a balanced view on that or the candidates that have a balanced view on that. Because I still believe that God didn't create Sunday for man. That Sunday, you know, that it's the other way around. Mm. Right? Um, and, and so I believe that and on the seventh day, he did rest, as, as we know from the good book. But, you know, that, that, that sh we should not only enjoy what, yeah. what nature and what a higher power has given us, but also make sure we take care of it. Yeah, too. yeah. I, I remember that in the Bible, it says that man was not created for Sunday. It was Sunday that was created for man. And I believe that all of these issues about the environment, it's so that the people have the benefit. But when you start taking their rights away from them to preserve the environment, I don't think that's a good thing, not, for, not in my book. Mm -hmm. I want a more balanced view of this, and I'm looking for candidates that have a balanced view okay. that understand that. Oh, fair enough. Well, thank you for your thoughts, uh, Mother Superior. We'll come back to you like in a little bit. Uh, but Liz, I'd, I'd like to ask you, like, like I was saying, right, you, and you've shared this many times on our show uh, publicly, is you know, your concerns with who's running and you know, how not only are they going to fix the issues that are ongoing and that continue to linger our community right now, but what plans they want to put into place going forward. It's not just for your quality of life, but also for that of your children and your grandchildren. That's correct. And Gina and I have been pretty vocal. And I too have been looking at the candidate interviews, trying to see who has something to offer our community and what are they um, going to do when they get into office. Um, one of the things is we don't want a career politician. We mm. want a, pol a politician that goes in there with a mindset to make a difference with the community. Because right now we're seeing issues that keep cropping up that need to be addressed. Luckily, we're pretty vocal and active that we've been uh, meeting with the senators when we see something that comes up to help correct it, to um, you know, amend certain laws to make a difference. Uh, so there are different issues that are in place right now that we have been addressing and meeting with the different um, senators that are in place. So for the new ones that go in, please don't go in to create new laws. Go in and look at what the current problems are and let's work together to correct it. And when you're going to uh, create a law, get the experts in the field to participate, to come to the table and work with you to uh, f to uh, create a bill that will be the solution and not the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes it's um, 
knee-jerk reaction, oh, there's a problem, let's fix it by doing this. But then you didn't take the experts into play to review it and get their feedback. You know, when you build a house, you have a home, and after 20 years, it starts to leak, or the sewer runs out. What do you do? There's maintenance that's required, right? So Guam have antiquated laws that need to be maintained and f fixed. So I think if you're new or if you're a senator already coming back in, we need to start looking. Let's maintain our house. Let's fix the plumbing. Let's fix the leaks. Let's not just let it sit and try to band-aid effect by taping stuff over it because over time it'll fall apart. Mm -hmm. So um, we're encouraging the community, speak up, pay attention, vote, you know, vote people in that will make that difference. I should emphasize the fact, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen watching this, that both Liz and Gina take very, very active, consistent parts in public hearings, in, you know, in dialoguing, reaching out directly to the senators and, you know, um, uh, not calling them out, but, you know, like basically saying, you know, I'd like to hold you accountable in a respectful and professional way. Because, you know, like I don't want to burn bridges, but I do want to say you're in a position to make change, hopefully if, immediately and everything like that. And, you know, why drag this kind of thing out over six months and everything like that? Could we work together mm -hmm. and get this thing done? We well, just had a meeting today, at the Guam Association of Realtors and the lieutenant governor came online and he talked about uh, issues that he's addressing within the government, which is great. So um, there's a collaborative effort when we bring up issues that the ones that we've been working with are looking to solve the problems and come up with solutions. It's never ending. We're still at the table and we are still continuing to have that dialogue so that the problems are corrected. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, Gina, but, is, there, is there anything to you that, that impresses upon you as far as the background of like a candidate? Like, you know, have they, not just worked in in the private sector or held managerial positions, but have they started their own business? Have they have they had military Actually, service? Have they yeah yeah no no level of education? I really um I mean we, I have I've often wished that everybody who runs for office m should have been in the private sector mm -hmm. because you're you know most of us are in the private sector. Most of the people you represent are in the private sector. I'm looking for people who have that private sector background because i believe they know what we're going through and if you've owned a business then you absolutely know what we're going through how hard it is out here to keep your business going to take care of your employees mm -hmm. um you know a, a lot of these businesses that have survived this this COVID lockdown and everything that has gone along with COVID, they understand what it takes the sacrifices you really have to make in order to stay open continue to be open and even now adjusting to what's to come. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking for candidates that, that understand that housing for the local community, there's always so much talk about the military community. And I can really appreciate that. We have an obligation to take care of our military families. They're serving. And so we have an obligation to take care of them. But at the same time, our community needs, our, whoever gets elected into office, we need them to also understand that our local families have chosen to stay on Guam because it, it's a hard decision when you think about your alternatives to say, you know what, I'm going to stay here and try to make a difference. Um, they also need help. And I think they actually need a little bit more help because right now in our business in, in real estate, we see that rents are becoming unaffordable to our local working class community. It is becoming unaffordable for our local working class community to buy homes. And I believe it's gotten to the point where the government needs to step in and say, okay, you know what? We're gonna have to contribute somehow to the investors that come to Guam. And when I say contribute, I don't mean monetary contribution. I mean like maybe if we looked at investors a little differently, if people come here and they're looking to build housing, why can't we facilitate the process so it's easier for them? Why does it have to be a one or a two year process for a residential developer to get a building permit and get all the approvals to start a project? Mm. You know, why can't the contribution from the government be, 
okay, if the developer is looking at putting X number of homes into this community, perhaps we can do a private public joint venture by doing X. I'm looking for senators to think along those lines, for senators who could think beyond the box, you know, outside of the box and figure out, okay, we can see that these things are happening in the states. Let's look to the states. But Let's you also want them to have the private sector bottom line mentality where, you know, like we're, we're going to think cost consciously. Yeah, because. But also results oriented. Ab absolutely. Don't we all want that? We would Isn't hope. that what we're hoping for? Yeah. You know, when you go into a business, don't you want service? And, you know, don't you want that service to deliver on the product that you say? And that's another thing. I want the senators that I vote for to tell me exactly what they're going to do. I don't want lofty ideas. I want mm. Action. commitments. Actual, Action. this is what I'm going to do to fix this problem. Um, you know, we can all come up with dreams, right? But that doesn't translate into reality all the time. Mm -hmm. So I want people who could give me concrete solutions and say, okay, I commit, I'm going to work on this. And you know what? Give yourself two years only. And after two years, get out get of the out. way and go do something else. Go back to your private sector job because I, I believe this is, you know, to be a senator, you're in the service industry and you shouldn't have, you know, I think it's like, Get in there, serve, and get out. Go back to your regular mm. job and see what you could do. That's an interesting approach because, uh, Liz, I know you remember this because it was exactly 20 years ago when former Governor uh, Carl Gutierrez it said, we have to run GovGuam like a, a business. business. And he said Correct. specifically that. Interesting, interestingly enough, now he's in charge of GVB That's and right. his title is president and CEO. So, mm -hmm. you know, he, he has worn that hat and he takes that approach to running things. Well, so. I remember we've been um, soliciting from business owners saying, hey, run for office you need to get a group of people who are business minded to run together get into office get the job done in two years and then get the heck out mm -hmm. and let another cycle of business owners to go in and help because gina's right it has to be run like a business if you don't show up to work or you didn't provide a, a product and you're in the private sector what happens mm -hmm. you're out i'm not hitting i'm not you're hitting my out. numbers here at kum yes, and everything exactly. like that exactly yeah. So in the government sector, it's run a little differently, but, you know, again, if you go in there, it's all about correcting what, what's the current situation? What do we need to do to make that difference? But yes, uh, the senators that go in, go in, make that difference. And then if you do a good job, maybe you'll be there again another two year term mm -hmm. to continue the, the work you're doing. But if you didn't, and you know what? The people aren't stupid. The people of Guam are smart. They're mm -hmm. watching. And we've seen the cycles that go in and out and some senators who didn't make it back because the people remember. So right now, I think the people of Guam are more savvy and they're paying attention. If you said something and you didn't perform or didn't deliver, they'll remember that the next time around. Liz, you said something that I thought was interesting is you said you don't want, I mean, I'm sure both of you would agree that you're not looking for career politicians, right? People that just want to, you know, Make stay, that stand difference. Yeah, but there is something to be said, I'm sure, for, for having experience as a policymaker, right? What is the optimum mix of having veteran, you know, senators who know how to, you know, for lack of a better term, who know how to play the game and you know how, know how the procedure works, but then also fresh minds, fresh perspectives, fresh energy, fresh it's, blood. It, it's like you're on the board. And uh, when you're on the board, there are senior individuals that are on the board and then a new cycle of new individuals in any uh, nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have been in business for a while or been on the board for a while know the ropes. And usually what happens, they take the newer ones under their wing and they train them. So I think uh, for the legislature, I, we're seeing sometimes there's not the spirit of cooperation mm -hmm. and it either the lines, the party lines are divided, issues become divided, but we're one island, one people, and the personal issue should be set aside, I think. And what is the greater good for our community? to make the difference, to correct the problem versus, well, you didn't vote for my um, bill the last time, therefore I'm not gonna vote for your bill. Mm -hmm. So there's gotta be, and, and we see that across the nation, there's division. So I think we're too small to play that game. Um, I think it behooves you if you come in, work together, and what is the greater good? 
the greater good is serving the people, then put your personal issues aside. Hmm. I'd like to ask both of you both of you a question I often ask of veteran senators, right? Let's start with you, Gina. Is there any difference on Guam between a Democrat and a Republican? Is there any difference? Well, policy-wise, I think there's some really big differences. Hmm. The abortion issue is one that I think is really big right now. That, that's a complete divide, right? Okay. Human rights. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, not even human rights. Hmm. I mean, I think the abortion issue is, I guess you can say it's human rights. Hmm. It's the right of an individual that hasn't been born yet. And that's a really big divide right now, isn't it? Sure. It really has completely, it's split right hmm. down the middle, Democrats and Republicans. Um, and I, I can't say that, that, that all Republicans are, you know, are against abortion and I can't say all Democrats are for abortion, sure. but I think that's a definite divide. But, you know, Liz mentioned earlier about, and maybe we're naive about how things work at the legislature, but we, d we, we do get responses because we do try to reach out a lot when we see a problem. We don't think that that problem is not our problem. We do feel like if there's something we can contribute, we're going to reach in and say, hey, senators, whomever, I've never, I have never been of the mindset that, okay, I'm only going to reach out to Democrats or Republicans. I just figure I'm reaching out to anybody who's going to be willing to listen mm -hmm. so that we can try, we want to feel like we're contributing to the solution. So when we notice problems, we do reach in there and say, hey, is there anyone who's willing to listen? So you know, here's what's going on, here's what we're seeing, what can we do to help? Which again is a very classical private sector approach, you, yes. the right tool for the right job. Yeah. Not just because yeah. like this person happens mm -hmm. to align with my, my particular party or, you know, this is, you know, this is Pari, this is Mully, this is Primo, yeah. this is Primo, whatever. Yeah. And, and what we're, sometimes what we get back from individuals is, from the senators is, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to assist you because this is under so-and-so's committee or blah, blah, blah. I don't understand that. If somebody has a problem and they reach out to Liz and say, hey, Liz, we've got a problem in your office and it isn't in her department, nor is it in my department, we still say, okay, you know what? I don't normally handle this, but right. I'm gonna step, what can I do to help? You know, mm -hmm. let's, let's figure it out. And if it means that I go over and talk to Liz and say, hey, Liz, I, I know this is in your, your department, but hey, you know, this was brought up, what can we do to fix it? It's, we're going to come up with solutions together. And that's where I, I, I'm saying, you know, maybe I'm naive about how this works, but I think it shouldn't be that way. It should be a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's why we're here. We want to get the message out, collaborate, work together, come up with solutions. And when I vote, I don't vote one line. I vote both lines. And I look yeah. for the person that will better serve our community. So that's our approach. We don't, just because it's a certain party, we don't go down that line. We take in both parties, their capabilities, their strengths, what are they going to do to help serve the community? So when we look at that approach, when we contact the senators, that's the same approach. It doesn't matter what party you're in. Yeah. And it should, again, emphasis, collaborative effort between both sides of the fence, because when I vote, when Gina votes, we don't vote one party line. And so we don't sit on our throne that, oh, I only handle residential. Go to Gina, she handles ABCD and mm -hmm. I don't. It's like, hey, we're jack of all trades. It's a small island and our people are counting, you know, are counting on you, the senators, mm -hmm. to make that difference. You know, that's the, that's the thing I wanna say. When, when a customer comes to our office, our mindset is, if they need help, it doesn't matter who they ask for. If that person's not there, we're all going to step in and help, right? I believe that if I were running for senator, I would think that once I'm voted, I am not just representing what the platform that I got voted for, not just my ideas, not just if I ran as a Democrat or a Republican, I am not just representing that, you know, Democrats or Republicans. Once I'm voted, I've been voted to serve the people period end of story you got voted in i i believe that that should be part of the hat you wear you're there to serve the people and please don't be too busy yes <laughs>
We, we are we are done in more ways than one, but you know the uh, the ballot tabulations continue. Um, we are going to cut out and end our evening of broadcast. We thank each and every one of you for staying with us as long as you have. I, we hope we've made it exciting, educational, informative for you. But coming up right now on NBC, we are going to PGA Golf, something all three of us can appreciate. But Nick Delgado continues uh, to report the latest ballot tabulations down at Election Central at UOG, so you can make sure to join us on our website and all of our social media platforms at KUM News for the very latest ballot tabulations as we head towards the end of the Super Saturday ballot. And we, of course, want to thank uh, Dr. Ron McNinch yes. for sticking it out with us. for uh, And uh, your uh, poll was spot on, Doc. Thank you. Right. Students do all the work. <laughs> all, right, all right. So we thank you so much for watching, everybody. Once again, golf coming up right here on KUM TV. We are going to end the live stream, but make sure to join us on our website and social media. For Nestor Lacanto, Dr. Rob McNinch, and the entire cast and crew here at the KUM Studios in Harmon, good morning. Good morning. <laughs>